Michelle. She Michelle. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for embracing this fierce, fierce cult in your um, eternal quest for knowledge. Uh, my name is Lewis Brown. I am not with the podcast, if you can see. Uh, I'm the programmer of uh, Cask Cinema. Uh, but Koda is actually having an event in Cask Cinema working on. So we are doing a topsy turvy, and I'm doing this stuff with me doing my stuff. So uh, I'll be your host for all of you. Um, today we have some uh, wonderful special people here tonight uh, Effie Weiss and Emil Bodenschein. They are uh, two visual artists who have done a Torah of different visual things, ranging from cinema to performances to essays to exhibitions you, you name it. Uh, their last work has been by the Troach, which will also be screened in uh, a cinema in January, but uh, maybe you can have some more commercial talk about this later. Um, but uh, first, uh, a very warming round of applause for Effie. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I will repeat it a bit and we'll, we'll say that uh, our idea was to talk mainly about a recent project or several projects that we did in the past five years, which under an umbrella of one research that we called Places of Articulation, and this will also become clear why it was called like that. But first we will tell you just a few words about ourselves and we will start by showing yeah, maybe yes. just um, one more to say that I'm, I'm really happy that okay. we're in this anatomical theater because um, well, the, the, main, the initial idea was to take a, a project and to look at it as, as a kind of an, as an object and to see how it, how it evolved and how it had its um, different manifestations and to, and to share it with you. Um, yeah, but we will stop with the... With a, with a short um, clip, with a short uh, scene from um, a documentary that we did, uh, the first um, long documentary that we did, 2013. Chao was here, she was working on the sound as well, we'll give her credit. Um, and this is the opening scene of the film, and then we'll say why, why we choose it as, a, as, the, first, as the first clip. Maybe should we turn? Yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. You are standing. Sorry for the sound, it's very low, I don't know why. Um, but why, why this clip is a starting point? Um, well, first the place, it's the place where we come from. We both come from Israel. And actually in this, in this scene, we're on the, um, on the border between Israel and Lebanon. 
um, and suddenly something pops up which kind of defines um, who is where if he is let's say welcome to Lebanon and I'm still uh, in Israel because of my Israeli SIM card and um, so we have where we come from the origin and we have the idea of suddenly an identity or a place or belonging that is imposed on us if he is Lebanese and or as being in Lebanon and I'm in Israel and this is also the the the, the place where three borders Israel Lebanon and Syria are um, are connecting so we speak about borders we speak about identity and we speak about um, us as, as Israelis or as ex-Israelis. I don't know if this would be very present, uh, the, the, the Israeli part of us, but as being from a place um, or as being um, somebody who left his own place and migrated or now uh, live in... Appreciate it. It's on. That's it. <laughs> it's one. Yeah, like I want the in between. Um. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Okay. That's it. And yeah. it's also about territories, which is will be part of the thing as well. Mm -hmm. So. The, the project that we would like to talk about, and it's more, let's say it's, it's, a, it's a research with several projects, uh, didn't start there, but actually in this uh, place, lovely place, it's a small village in Northern Ireland, where we, it's called Kushendal. And it's a small Catholic <coughs> village where we spent only two months uh, doing um, artist residency. And as we are ex-Israelis and Catholics a bit by default are pro-Palestinians, doesn't matter, we are also pro-Palestinians. <laughs> it doesn't matter, our passport is Israeli. <laughs> so, uh, so it's, already um, a political situation yes uh, our presence there is already already raising questions and in this village uh, we stayed in a artist in residency where, where there was no wi-fi connection and we used to go to this cafe every morning to check a bit our mails and to chat with a cafe owner and to talk politics of course so, well, I mean, the, the political question was was there. It always, yeah. uh, I mean, we always got somehow to this to this question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one day he told us he was a retired teacher, and he told us that uh, he still does uh, replacement jobs from time to time. He's called to replace a teacher on on sick leave or whatever. And he told us that there would always be a student, uh, a pupil, that will ask him to spell a word containing the letter H. And they ask him that because they don't know him. Is it? As a replacement teacher, he's a new teacher, they, they, he doesn't know the class and the class doesn't know him. And so they ask this question to hear how he says this, the name of this letter. Because apparently Catholics and Protestants do not call the letter by the same name. Protestants call it H, like we commonly know. Well, like the English pronounce it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the Catholics say, call it H. And so they just try to understand who is in front of them. And he told us that this was one of the ways that Catholics and Protestants would, would recognize each other or maybe the, the, the enemy during the troubles, which was the, I don't know, may, may, I don't know if you know, an ongoing conflict in Northern Ireland, very bloody conflict. And um, 
yeah, this could have very serious consequences if you are from the wrong community. So when we heard this story, mm -hmm. well, it immediately ringed ring the bell um, to a, another story which happened long, long, long time ago. Um, it's a biblical story that um, that is a story of two tribes, two Israeli tribes. Um, on the same territory, but there was some, some sort of a dispute. Um, and during the dispute, or maybe um, instead of me telling the story, we have um, an, an, well, a, a, a scene from, from the film, a scene that actually opens the film, of an um, American preach uh, that kind of tells the story With an animation, I hope the sound, I think the sound here is better. So there's a battle. There's not much to told about it until it gets to the point where the Ephraimites are on the run. They have been routed. They are losing and they run for their lives. Now they get back home, they need to cross back over the Jordan River. And as they try to cross, they are killed, one by one, with cruel efficiency. It all comes down to this word, shibboleth. When someone's going to cross, are you an Ephraimite? Why not? Okay, say shibboleth. This is a word that means a flowing stream. It's a natural word to talk about when you're at the ports of the Jordan River. Would you like to cross again? The shibboleth? Say that one. And if they pronounce it, shibboleth, then they know they're actually the accent and the dialect, perhaps it's even spelled different when they write it out. There's, there's two different letters in Hebrew, there's one that's sheen, and then there's one that's seven, and the difference is probably even a little more subtle than our S-H versus S. Show up, so up, and so, and so close. So it rings a bell not only in terms of the content of the story, but also it rings a bell for us as um, because one of the things that interests us and uh, that interests us most is um, um, a group identity or group belonging or how do we uh, define ourselves as being this or that? Um, how do we relate, for example, to a, to a place if we speak about national identity? Um, how to how do we relate to it to a community? How do we define our community in uh, opposition on in relation to other community? And that suddenly, I mean, this very accurate linguistic test of identifying not even a word, a sound in somebody's speech. I mean, the sound that he can emit then that defines where he comes from or which community he belongs to. This is something that um, immediately drew our attention and we started, actually this was the starting point or this was the, 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 the beginning of this, uh, of this research. And quite, quite, uh, almost immediately we called this, we gave it this working title, Places of Articulation, because Places of, of articulation, it's a linguistic term. It's the specific, very anatomic points in our uh, speech organs where, uh, so, where sounds are produced. Yes, like the tip of the tongue is a place of articulation. The, yeah, the, the throat, the vocal cords, oh, many, we have many places of articulation. But what we liked is this, it already contains this idea of territory, because it's, we have this word, place. And we were quite excited about the idea that uh, the place of our work, whether it will be a film or... We didn't know at that point what it will become, but we were excited to think about the location 
really in cinematic terms, the location as the throat. So a location which is mobile. It's not, uh, it's not, doesn't belong to a certain geographical territory, but it echoes the whole idea of geographical territories. So this is a bit how we started, and we started researching, first of all, what, where do we find these uh, manifestations of Shibolet? So, in a way, we told ourselves, we, we, we assumed that if, if we find this story 3,000 years ago in a, biblical sto in a biblical story somewhere in Palestine, and we find it today in Northern Ireland, it must exist everywhere, in every time. And yeah, when you think about it, it's the most obvious thing. Yeah, it's very natural. We meet each other, you meet a new person, I meet a new person. Whether I want it or not, I, I make some judgments based on their speech. It can, maybe I would, I would not, I would not know their origin, but I would probably know if it's a foreigner to this country or not. I would know, or I would guess I know something about the social status. Of course, I might be completely wrong, but these judgments will happen whether we want them or not. And, well, I think I think yeah. maybe if we were, if we were in Ghent now, yeah. only a couple of kilometers from here, uh, we would find Bruges, and in the in the 14th century, 14th, yeah. Not, yeah, 1304. 14th, yeah, 1304. So you probably know the Schillenfried uh, uh, episode, uh, the the, the Bruchen Maiden, which is I think also connected to um, national identity, but it, it is based on the same idea of this shibboleth or the age test or whatever, but the idea of um, belonging to a group by a specific sound. And by doing this test, um, pointing or defining who is the other, with the consequences, of course. And um, there's, there's also maybe an, Another scientific anecdote that that um, really what was very interesting for us in all this process, and is that that when we are born, um, we have we are born with the potential of saying or of pronouncing um, all the sounds that exist in the world, all the vowels and the, in, in the world's world's languages. Yeah. Yeah. Which are, I can't remember the, the number, like... Uh, 600 consonant <laughs> and uh, 200 vowels, if I'm not mistaken. But then in a certain point, very early in our life, um, like around six months, the, the sounds that we hear will shape somehow the, our vocal cavity and we will be able to hear and pronounce only the words, only the sounds right, that we heard. So we kind of limit, or the, 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 the brain limits itself, and the body limits itself to the borders of this territory, this um, sonoric linguistic territory. And we found this um, quite, quite fascinating. And what we found later more fascinating is, that, is how people try to to play or try to cross or try to um, to traverse this border and to stretch it and to um, get to or to arrive to other to other territories. So we, we started a, a research which was first of all just finding these many other uh, shibolets and shibolet like situations that exist today and on the one hand and on the other hand we try to find ways of showing this because as visual artists the one of the first questions would be we are talking here about voice and sound which has no image and has no it's not a matter everything uh, uh, even so it's just air that is uh, 
So traversing the vocal cavity. Traversing the, the vocal cavity and through the frictions and the obstructions become different sounds. So how do we show this? How do we, what, what kind of shape can it take? And, and then other questions about uh, visual representation. How, how do we show this equivalent to territories? How do we show the violence that is embedded in this practice? And so these were our questions while, while, uh, while uh, searching. And the first um, uh, outcome that, that, to, that came about was at a very early stage, when uh, in, still in the process of uh, researching, we were supposed to uh, show something uh, from this residency. Actually, we were invited with other artists who did the same program to show a work in a, in a gallery in in Derry, Derry slash London Derry. That's another shibboleth, by the way, because uh, the city Derry, London Derry in Northern Ireland is called differently by the... It reminds you something <laughs> that places have two names. It's a bit here too. So um, in Derry, London Derry, there is this gallery and we were supposed to show something and we still didn't have any work. We just had this uh, research a bit ongoing and we decided to present the research but in a perf performative way and also in a participatory way and actually to make a performance that will become the, then the exhibit in this exhibition. So we created this setup and maybe we can explain a bit that in the middle... Mm -hmm. so what you see to... here is the, um, is the setup that people see when they go in the space. There is a, a large, we don't want to call it table, it's just a large round surface uh, that becomes a kind of um, 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 a board where people can write on or it becomes a kind of a, a map uh, that will record the traces of the, of the performance. And then they meet a couple of, um, of objects on the table and a marker. Um, in the middle of this surface, there is a microphone. This microphone will capture the sound that is, um, that is being set around the table. And you see in the center of the, of the um, well, just next to the center or around the microphone, there's a shape, kind of a geometric shape. And uh, because the microphone is connected to the computer that you see in the corner, and uh, there's an algorithm that was uh, created by Max, uh, that was created in Max SP. And this will um, take a couple of parameters from the sound that is uh, captured and will create a form based on, uh, based on this sound. So this is constantly running and then maybe you can move to the... Yeah, so basically this shape is constantly moving because Every sound we emit around the table is, is uh, represented. And uh, yeah, there are some elements on the wall, but we will not go into that now, I think. So this event is limited to a number of people that fit around the table. And we just uh, went through our findings together. So people are they get a short text that they read out loud. And these short texts, they tell very short and varied episodes, contemporary episodes, where we have uh, shibboleth-like situations. I will give one example, maybe. Uh, an Israeli parliamentarian said in, the, in, a, in a speech in the parliament, that uh, she had doubt about the doubts about the uh, national claims of national claims of Palestinians because the sound p doesn't exist in Arabic. So how can they be Palestinians? <laughs> yeah. Then of course later on she said it was a joke, but 
there are some examples of this kind of jokes that turn out really badly. So, uh, so all kinds of anecdotes, some are more serious, some are some with very severe consequences, like you saw in the biblical story. People were killed, and there are other incidents like this, which were very deadly. So people are reading these stories. They also, and when there is a, a sound in, quest, in question, for example, in the story I just said, the P and the B, yeah, because, okay, Palestinians, they don't say P, usually they say instead B, like most Arabic speakers. So when we have this kind of conflictual sound, we ask the whole group around the table to emit this sound and we see the shape of this sound creating, created on the table. We ask them to mark it. Maybe we have here, mm -hmm. okay, reading the text and here yeah. mm -hmm. we mark the territory of one of these sounds. So gradually we get, we create this map which maps the sounds, but also documents the whole event and becomes some kind of uh, an exhibit that people can later visit and reconstruct. The, yeah, there are other elements. There are objects on the table. We ask people to do all kinds of uh, actions with it, but they are all related to these sounds and the stories that are connected to these sounds. Do you want to say anything else about this? No, so the performance is a kind of a ceremony. It's a kind of a... Um, um, here, for example, there is a... Uh, there's, an, there's also a story with a, with a hazelnut. So uh, everybody takes a hazelnut in, in, in their hands and they stretch out their arms and, and then they throw it on the table and the sound is, is a kind of a... Um, um, kind of a gun machine or something like this. Um, so it's a series, like if it's a series of actions, of sound emitting and, uh, and um, a ceremony. Mm -hmm. So th this was the very first thing we did related to this uh, research. And we also very recently, just a few months ago, we came back to it and developed this into a bigger performance. I mean, bigger, longer, <laughs> let's say, because in terms of the amount of people, it's still the same. And the, basic, uh, the basics of, the, of this round surface and the actions are the same. But yeah, it's more elaborated. It's like five years later with everything that we learned and tried out and things that we discovered. So it became a more um, of a performance of, uh, on its own sake and not just a device to create a, an exhibition. So. Um, well, we skip a bit because this is already an installation that we did um, with some episodes or some uh, what we call testimonies or monologues with people who actually went in a certain point went through uh, or tackled in their life this uh, situation of of shibole um, this is a photo from Vils in brussels where it was shown last year um, and well the, the idea was to kind of create, yeah, the idea was to create, um, I mean, in terms of installation, to put the monologues not in one, um, not in a single screen, but to give each one of them, uh, they also in different languages, so to create these territories, uh, also sonorically in the space, and to give each one his own, um, its, well, its own um, space, um, I mean, in terms of installation, but also in terms of sound. So people could um, travel between those uh, monologues. And in terms of sound, what you have is a kind of a fade in, fade out to a different, uh, to a different territories. But maybe first just to say, 
So we were searching for these stories, first, like, theoretically, just to understand how they are uh, manifested in, in contemporary life. And we found, yeah, different uh, domains or areas where it's, it is practiced. You will, I will, we will show you some of these uh, short uh, films. And we, cho the, 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 we, we made this choice to film, to, so, and then we had to find the, the people who actually lived this kind of situation. So it's one thing to read about it in the newspaper, for example, I will take for an, as, an, as an example one of the little stories that we have in, uh, in the performance of a policeman that had to track down illegal workers in the Netherlands in, the, in a small village in a blocker store. And to, as a first identification device, this policeman decided <coughs> just to ask people to say the word Kvartje. And according to him, he could, he could hear if the person is a foreigner or not. Of course, it wouldn't be the, the last judgment, but this would make a person suspect or not. Just by pronouncing the, the, the was something. Mm -hmm. So, say we hear this story, now we have to find a person that can tell this story. So either the policeman who did that, or the per a person who, who was... Uh, interrogated in such a way. So we didn't look for this specific story, but just to, to make you a bit understand the difficulty of how would you find this kind of stories? Because I don't know, I mean, any, any one of you in this room might have experienced something similar, maybe not with a policeman, but with when you were, I don't know, some, you who's, were in who's a foreign from, country. Who's from Ghent here? Can you pronounce an R, a rolling R? <laughs> <laughs> because this is, well, yeah. sure later, but this, I mean, this is kind of a thing that, you know. Yeah, but not, not, not necessarily a problem, yeah? Not yeah. necessarily mm -hmm. causing a problem, but say again, we will, for us, it's the easiest is to talk about a place where we are coming from. If you were a Palestinian trying to just rent an apartment in Tel Aviv and the, uh, how, uh, even if your Hebrew is very, very good, the, the landlord would speak with you a bit longer just to hear how, if you can actually say P or do you replace it with B. And this would probably make the apartment unavailable all of a sudden. So how can we know who have experienced this? Because it could be anyone in the street. It's not a, like it's not like a big story. It can be huge as well. It can cost some a person's life as well. But it can also be these kind of small stories that, yeah, they don't sound dramatic, but they are. So there was a very long process of finding these people, finding these stories, finding these people. And if you would like, and if we we have, we have time, we can maybe talk a bit more about this uh, productional aspects and, mm -hmm. and research aspects. Yeah, but in and parallel, there is also the research of how to shoot them, yeah. because we wanted to film them in a settings where um, the sound is visible or there is some sort of um, manifestation of the sound, but in, 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 in image. Um, so maybe we can show yeah. the. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we will, what we will show you now is um, um, basically the. Um, we will show five, the five videos. Five episodes that uh, are shown, but they are just sequenced on on a timeline. So there are three three seconds black between them, and then maybe we can speak about the the, the settings or the tools that we are using. Um, Let's launch the video. Yeah, so these are five videos that are, no. Uh -huh. Five videos that I, uh, appear on each of these monitors. I just find the sound here a little bit. No. Low. Do you know what to do? 
Yeah, that's the mustard, <laughs> so just launch it then, yeah. Okay. But um, this is easy. Just turn it off. My name Mark Finn identifies me as Amish. Well, my surname does. For Mark is a deliberately neutral name chosen by the parents because Finn marks me as someone from the Catholic nationalist community of Northern Ireland. Finn isn't a common name, so invariably I have to spell it out over the phone. And if the person on the other end of the phone is a Protestant, and they repeat my name to me, spelling it out, P-H-A-L-A-N. It sounds to me that they're correcting my pronunciation, not confirming the spelling correctly. Maybe that is what they're doing. But sometimes it's obvious that it's more than that. And so sometimes I'll also spell it out again, careful this time to emphasize the H, H, H. P-H-E-L-A-N. Now this all sounds literally and figuratively innocuous, but for me, it's an invisible personal and political tussle over identity. I know what's actually being said. They know what's actually being said. We're both asserting our identity in the act of spelling out my name. At least, that's how it's famous to me. But these silly things can matter. Sometimes they're serious, as I know from my own experience. Of when I was a kid, walking my auntie's dog or Coney in Waterworks Park in West Belfast. It's an area of the city that's a patchwork quilt of Catholic nationalist areas alongside Protestant Unionist areas. And it's where most of the killings and the conflict took place, partially, perhaps, because of its proximity of both communities. As I walked around the lower lake, I was who I am, Mark Freeman. I lived in Salisbury Avenue, I went to Our Lady of Lourdes Primary School and the Catholic Church of the Resurrection on Cable Road. But in the northern part of the waterworks, when walking near the west end across the state, I called myself Mark Pacey. I lived in Henderson Avenue, went to the mostly Protestant BRA Primary School and the Methodist Church. The Cable Road. I used to walk around that park rehearsing both identities just in case I was stopped by older gangs of boys. Though usually nothing ever happened, only once was I asked to leave, but I was ready for it because one sunny day in Waterworks when I was about 10, I was punched in the face by some older boys from the West End State, which was Protestant. The boy who hit me later became a notorious loyalist thug in the local paramilitaries. He went on to kill a young man who was a very good friend of mine, someone I admired for his grace and beauty. And the man who killed him was once the boy who asked me to say the eighth letter of the alphabet, and who hit me hard when I said H. The 
Pytamy więc, iść na tym między. Co jeśli por umieszczam tylko świetle? No powiedz ten drzwi mówimy, to nie myśli ma to w Easy Boot, to jakieś tam jest wyberiemy. Proto to nie wiem, czy jeszcze będzie na ferety. Proponuję mi koncentrę, de prostie, patrz na ten punkt. I chcę, że pan Państwo puści to. To jeszcze nie wiem, proszę pan. Ja proszę pan, jest mi czerc i bez słyszą, to jest mój świetny sztar. Pan Szyro pan ma jedną z gałnicy. Damit ich wie Daniela Fahrer zu Kindern konnte, würde ich ihr vorstellen. Ich habe eine 24-jährige Frau vorgestellt, die einen Abschluss in Finanz hatte. Sie trägt einen Anzug, schöne Haare und Make-up und hatte ihr eigenen Raum mit einem Computer mit zwei oder drei Computerbildschirmen. Ein Mann stellt sich fast aus Sichern für die Schweinbilder. Und ich sage, ja, du hast es denn, wenn ich dann spreche, ich habe hier auch schon viel zu ja, da war nicht mehr mit mir, die sich gerade ja, wenn das nur ein Algorithm, ich muss fast nur, es ist fast sehr hier, um zu arbeiten, ja, Leute, die man hier dann muss, ja, von der Regel, von der Geschichte. Das ist eine Witz. Auf der Original sind wir bei Reformation in Chaika, der Prostako, die wir schon in der Maschine, o pokud by bylo jen tohle pár pikulí, a to je proto, že si nekačím vůbec vůbec. Zajímavé je, že si můžete od dospělých a své job a lůže a své špičky lidé anšlovat a zkusit jí jen betrůvající finanční rady si to vykoupit. Víš, že si můžete nic o tom vůbec nespravně vědět. Sie war Italienerin, die Deutsch aus äh, ihrer Freundin und aus der Familie sie die Deutschen gelernt hatte. Und ja, das war ein Problem, drin, dass ihr häufige Fehler, falsche Aussprache oder andere schreckliche Hindernisse, die sie hatte, erklären wollte. Sonst äh, wurde sie irgendwie dazu aussetzen. Deutsch zu sprechen und äh, die Deutsche zu kriegen, war für mich für sich aber sehr erschreckend, weil, weil ich meinen, meinen Wunsch und meinen äh, Kiefer musste die ganze Zeit stehen müsste. Bei der Ende des Tages, meiner Weise, wurde ich so sein, dass ich nicht mehr in der Lage war, so diese harte deutsche Buchstaben wie sie ausdrücken zu können. Sprechen? Sprechen, Sprache, Sprache, Sprechen, Sprechen, Sprache, Sprache. Ik 
denk dat ik mij altijd eerder een jongen heb gevoeld, maar mijn meisjes en mijn vrouwen gegaan en zelfs mijn vrouwelijke expressie vond ik persoonlijk eigenlijk nooit geen tegenstelling. Maar de rest van de mensheid vindt dat wel. En ik heb echt zo vele jaren vruchteloos gecommuniceerd met mijn omgeving, met mijn voornaam worden. Dat lukt dan niet, die mensen aan je mensen begrepen dat niet of konden dat niet aanvaarden. En ik denk dat ik dan pas echt gender dysphorie heb gekregen. Doordat ze ervaren dat dat gewoon niet lukt om, om dat te communiceren. En uh, ook met mijn stem, omdat mensen mij een aantal keer hebben gezegd dat ze mij verraden. Allee, dat mijn stem mij verraden. En dan werd ik mij echt hyperbewust van mijn giegel en de hoge klank van mijn stem. En de, ik heb het gevoel dat de samenleving echt zo elke dag vol douaniers rondloopt die permanente grenscontroles houden. En dan die lichamelijke kenmerken, zoals een boga of een lage stem, zijn dan nu noodzakelijk papieren om in het een of in het andere territorium toegelaten te worden. Maar wat zou je dus doen dan? で、これで、で、これで、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、
شب ترشیدان چون بیدم ترشیدان چون این مارو ترد که یه به اجابه شید دیدیم مارو من هم گرگی درستان پکنی پرمان رو درستان من هم پکنی درستان گرگی درستان رو دیدیم مارو درستان این کشی دیشه نسانه و من اگه راید شده سنه دیگه درستان من هم که دیستان مارو پکنی Then Tawun Und hier auch die Transformbrücken. Jetzt können wir bei der Artikulation ziehen. Wichtig. Wenn wir die Zunge entsprechend weg und entsprechend wieder aber auch je nach tiefer Winkel auf uns zugeben oder bei der Umrundung so ein bisschen nach vorne führen. Das BAMF hat im September 2017 angefangen, direkt Analysen durchzuführen, wenn die Flüchtlinge nach Deutschland kommen, wo uns kein gültigen Pass dabei war. Das wurde vor allem bei. Seit September 2017 setzt das BAMF automatische Direktanalyse-Tools ein, um herauszufinden, wo geführt wird sich herkommen. Als dieses System vorgestellt wurde, war nur bekannt, dass das BAMF damit also die Verfahren schneller und sicherer machen will. Und ich wollte eben mehr wissen, wie das funktioniert und welche Systeme das sind. Und habe dann zum Beispiel Informationsfreiheitsanfragen gestellt, mit denen man Dokumente von Behörden erfahren kann. So habe ich das Benutzerhandbuch bzw. die Dienstanweisungen und die Schulungsunterlagen zu diesem System bekommen und konnte mir eben anschauen, was die BAMF-Mitarbeiter und die Entscheider zu sehen bekommen wenn sie Dialektanalysen bei Geflüchteten durchführen. Wenn eine Person nach Deutschland kommt und registriert wird, das heißt, wenn sie ihre Fingerabdrücke abgeben muss, wenn sie diesen ganzen 
ersten Prozess durchlaufen muss, dann wird auch schon die Strafanalyse durchgeführt, wenn die Person zum Beispiel keinen gültigen Pass vorweisen kann. Und das Prozedere an sich ist ganz einfach. Die Person nimmt einen Telefonhörer, es wird eine Nummer gewählt, die 72999, dann wird die Nummer der Dienststelle des Fangs eingegeben und die Nummer des Antragstellers oder der Antragstelle. Die Person bekommt dann ein Bild vorgelegt. Das Bild enthält zum Beispiel Alltagsszenen wie Familie mit Kindern vor einem Haus oder eine Essensszene und soll dann zwei Minuten lang dieses Bild beschreiben. Nach zwei Minuten piepst es, die Aufnahme ist fertig und die ganzen Mitarbeiter bekommen diesen Bericht dann per Mail zugeschickt und können den Mittel wieder sichern. Das Programm funktioniert, indem es von Ihnen analysiert wird. Das heißt, dem Programm ist es egal, welches Wort ich benutze. Es schaut sich eben nur an, wie ich meine Sprache forme. Und dafür muss das System erstmal genug Beispiele kennen, mit denen es überhaupt trainieren kann, welche Sprache sich von welcher anderen Sprache wie unterscheidet. Und von diesen sogenannten Trainingsdaten hängt auch ab, wie zuverlässig dieses System ist. Wenn die Sprache von einmal abgeschlossen und analysiert ist, kommt ein Zettel per Mail und auf diesem Zettel stehen vor allem Prozentangaben. Da steht dann zum Beispiel drauf, die Person spricht zu 68% Wahrscheinlichkeit Türkisch und vielleicht zu 14% Wahrscheinlichkeit Hebräisch und 5% sind andere Sprachen, die wir nicht erkannt haben. Aber das Problem ist, dass die Mitarbeiter im Land, und das die Entscheider später über den Asylantrag entscheiden sollen, überhaupt keine Informationen oder Vorgaben darüber haben, ab wann so eine Ergebnis aussagen kann. Wir können gute Ergebnisse vermitteln mit ihren Nachkommen stellen, dass sie genau sind. Und so kann es eben passieren, dass der Mensch dem Computer mehr vertraut als dem Geflüchteten, der ihm gerade vor ihm ist. Weil da steht dann eine Zahl und diese Zahl ist in einer Prozentangabe ausdrücken und damit kann ich dann eine Entscheidung, die ich hinterher treffe, leicht rechtfertigen, weil der Computer das gesagt hat. Der Computer ist ja vermeintlich objektiv. Das wenn wir davon ausgehen, dass die Ergebnisse nicht stimmen können und wenn wir uns das bewusst machen, generieren wir trotzdem Misstrauen, da wo keine sein müsste. Das heißt, wenn all meine Geschichten, wenn all meine Dokumente darauf hindeuten, dass sie aus Syrien kommen, der Computer aber sagt, ich komme aus Ägypten, ist da trotzdem Misstrauen. So may I would like to say first something about this um, video. So we feel more than more uh, little, let's say, episodes or scenes like this. They were all based on uh, the principle of a monologue. We worked with these people on their monologue beforehand, different degrees of uh, writing, so sometimes it was really written, sometimes it was just like uh, uh, anchor points in their monologues, but no. there was a preparation and the, there was this uh, setup that was known to them, although of course they, you, you can't really imagine how it will be, like what the physical experience will be on the spot. and. Uh, in a way, it was a very fragmented material. It was just like this bubble and this bubble and this story and this story. Kind of, you could say, even more of the same on the one hand, because they all, it's always this moment of uh, confronting uh, an anatomical border, let's say, or a border that is inscribed in our anatomy or, or perception or in our body, and of course there were there are, there are also differences, and in a way it kind of uh, landed itself to a sort of uh, installation like this where the the 
the, each each uh, monologue is on its own, and the spectator can move around and create uh, a trajectory. All trajectories are equally valid, but. In parallel, we also wanted to make a film and to kind of uh, develop an argument and to, and to um, include uh, also other materials that were not only these things that we shot, but also many things that we found. And, um, that, and that's obviously a totally different challenge because how, how do you take something which is like I said before, in an exaggerated way, more of the same, and make it uh, into a sort of a narration that starts at one point and ends at a different point. So we worked on it a lot, but I think I first wanted to... <laughs> yeah, we first we will just uh, finish to describe a bit the installation, because apart from the five uh, monitors, there was a sixth monitor that we see here, which is again the same uh, visual tool that you saw the Tibetan guy was holding. But also that was, on, chest, the, but was also, also on the table in, 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 the, in the, performance. the performance. So it was just uh, an invitation to the audience, to the spectators, to, to uh, see their voice as well in the same, with the same shapes. And on the wall, what you can see there, and that's in another space uh, in another uh, museum. Uh, what you see on the, on the wall is an uh, illustration taken from, taken from this, uh, from a manual that uh, the person in the last episode speaks about in, this, uh, in the German immigration authority. So it's a manual that uh, explains uh, to the employees of the uh, immigration office how to use the dialect de detection tool. So this was uh, on the wall. Well, maybe just um, maybe one word about mm -hmm. about the settings of the of the shooting of the episodes, mm -hmm. because we were looking. Well, the, the tools that you see here, um, or the settings in which people are filmed in, is are not the tools that are used by, for example, the BAMF, like the the, the German. Um, uh, foreign authority uh, in their in their um, language in in their language test. Though most of them are um, tools that are used in research, uh, either in laboratories or uh, so for academic reasons or science for scientific reasons, medical medical reasons. But what we wanted in these settings is to kind of um, manifest the violence um, that is imposed by people uh, by doing this test. And um, we found out that, what well, we found out, we, we thought that putting the, the, the person who's, interview, uh, who's interviewed in this situation or showing them the mechanism that extracts basically what, what they, they do in, for example, uh, the, the German authorities, but in a different way, but extracting the voice and making it into, into data and based on this data, um, creating this border, this quite binary border of yes, no, go, no, go, uh, can go through, cannot go through. And um, yeah, this is something that we found works um, best or that is kind of present in those, uh, in those episodes. Um, in the film, if you go, I mean, we're showing now a, a, um, a short sequence of the film. It's more of um, because we had those, we had the testimonies that we kind of refer to as islands, and we had to create the sea, like a kind of a, um, a substance in which those islands would be, and how to, uh, like if you said, how to travel or how to guide. Um, the, the 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 spectator from from one scene to another. So what we chose to show you is kind of a, a passage from one episode to another, from one monologue to another, 
in which we use part of the uh, part of the materials uh, that kind of helped us to to get us from one place to another. Yeah, we would we wouldn't like to tell a lot about the film or to show a lot because you are invited to see the whole film next month. Uh, yeah, so this. It starts with a guy who's actually here from Ghent. So it's the end of the and the end of a, of a scene. So from the end of this scene to the beginning of the next, this is what we do. Okay, this Tom will be the from the So he basically starts the sequence that you saw before of the Albanian girl. Um, yeah, what, what you see here in this in this passage is that um, there are archive footage um, mixed with tutorials or stuff that we found on on YouTube. Yeah, also a, a big archive. Um, music that was made for the film, um, and also a voiceover that kind of accompanies the um, the narration, uh, which is kind of yeah, we're looking for um, um, for 
a voice or for um, a dialect or an accent that is not really um, traceable. Some, somehow no, not, not English, not uh, uh, American, not Australian, something that is very, very neutral and that can, that can um, be without a defined territory. Okay, so last uh, yeah, last thing mm -hmm. that we will show only photos. So that's yet another uh, manifestation. manifestation or outcome of this project, which uh, is very recent. It's uh, we just it's an exhibition that we installed two weeks ago, and here what we wanted to do, or maybe before we do that, no, okay, first this, then maybe I will say some in addition, but so here what you can see is first again the, uh, I mean, the same episodes, there are uh, six and not five and also two screenings. And what we decided to do here in the installation is we keep the same idea of uh, yeah, different isolated uh, stories and also this idea that was also there in the installation that you encounter them like you encounter a person. So the height is kind of a human height, the size of the monitors are giving more or less a real size of a, of a head in front of you, maybe a bit bigger, but still the 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 um, the encounter is it feels like one on one, and we also decided to uh, locate them in the passages in the gallery, so not uh, not arbitrarily in this not scattered in the space and not uh, against the walls, but more something that will make the visitor aware of this act of passing from one space to another. So we mm, used basically the architecture of, of the space to find out where are these passages and how we can make them more present in the way that you are basically blocked by something or you have to change a bit your body position to in order to pass and so on. A, a, apart from the, from the monitors, we also had all these uh, objects on podiums and on, on shelves. And these are kind of, uh, you can say, relics from our research. Some are things we actually found, so they are ready-made. Some are objects that we created for the film. Maybe we can see uh, the palette, which is very clear, and then we can talk about others. Not about all of them, but yeah. This one, for example, that's... Uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, a tool that was created for the film. So in one of the episodes, I, I call them episodes, but it's not an episode, it's one of the scenes or one of the monologues is uh, told by someone who pu puts this thing in her mouth and basically you see all these points which are uh, electrodes and the, whenever the, and this palette maps all the all the, all the points, where the, points where the tongue touches the upper palate and it gives a, an output of that, a kind of a, a map. So this is something, okay, we didn't invent it, it's, a, it's an existing tool, it's used for medical research and in the film it, it was used to, to have a, a visual output of her speech. But there are also other other items like, for example, give me something. Yeah. Well, that's uh, that's the a three D model of the of the vocal tract from the lips, which are in the front to the just above the vocal cords. That's the bass there, or maybe the this. Mm, mm -hmm. that's a bit similar. I mean, too close. Maybe you can go back to the yeah the the candle. Or this. So the candle, I don't know if you noticed also in the performance, a candle is a, 
a common tool used by uh, speech therapists and language teacher to actually teach a speaker the difference between p and b that I mentioned before, because b uh, is a voiced vowel, uh, consonant and p is unvoiced, but otherwise they are very, very close. And to see the dif to, to actually vi see the difference visually, if you hold the candle in front of your mouth and you say p, the flame should uh, extinguish, and if you say b, it shouldn't be affected, actually. So that's just the candle is about that. And a couple of words about the, the homemade rainbow? Uh, maybe not. Okay. No, because no, just because I, it's because not, of the film. Yeah, because okay. they haven't seen anything it's related. To, I mean, it's a lot. Of, I think it's quite long to explain, but uh, maybe this. Hmm? So this, for example. But also some some of the objects that were on the table while we were doing the the performance. Um, there are a lot of shibboleth words that are um, that use food. Uh, food names or words, food, uh, from food. words from food. Um, the bread that you see here, the bread is, is, is quite, quite a, an interesting one because it's used currently now in Ukraine. Um, Ukrainians that want to or that spot somebody who's suspicious as, in, as a Russian infiltrator, they would ask them to pronounce a word that means bread in Ukrainian, and it's called Palanitsya. And apparently the Russians cannot pronounce the word in the same way. And this is how they, this is how they spot them. And well, as in, in, in several places, this word has become like a national um, symbol. Um, and there are, there are uh, songs about it, and uh, it has become a symbol of, of this um, um, rebellion or uh, combat. This, uh, combat against against the Russians. If you Maybe. go to YouTube, you can find some amazing, amazingly also violent uh, uh, videos about about this, uh, not about this story, but I mean, things that things that happen and people put online. But maybe one thing about this, uh, we found out about this Palinita uh, recently, of course, because it's recent and it was, it, it, it's interesting because for years we were researching this and we read all kinds of stories. For example, the, the hazelnuts that you see here on, on a wire, they are related to, a, to an episode in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. So when the conflict between Azeris and Arme Armenians who pronounced the word for uh, hazelnut differently, funduk and punduk. And yeah, and you read this story that during uh, uh, violent, uh, violent uh, incidents, they were identifying Armenians like this and were taken out of uh, buses and killed because they said punduk and not funduk. And it sounds kind of, sometimes it sounds like an urban legend. It's like, yeah, it's like two, uh, to, 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 uh, to mythological to it. Yeah, exactly. And then we see these uh, uh, video clips from Ukraine that actually, where you see exactly the same thing really happening in front of your eyes. So people are so, dressed on the street, people are um, uh, like um, war prisoners are being uh, interrogated. Atta interrogated and forced to say this word. So here, what we have as well is the tomato, which was uh, this type of shibboleth word in the Lebanese civil war, and chickpeas that were used in Sicily in the 13th century. And maybe we have the parsley as well? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And the parsley that we made, I mean the others we made as well. Um, another uh, she bought it word, and there's uh, there's also uh, yeah, it's a it's a more of a famous incident in the Dominican Republic. Uh, there was 
uh, this incident that is called the Parsley Massacre because Haitians that were working in the Dominican Republic were, were identified by showing them uh, uh, the parsley, uh, yeah, a mm -hmm. bunch of parsley, and they had to say the name. And Haitians they speak Creole, so they don't roll the R like in Spanish. The word in, in Spanish is perejil, and they would say they would omit the R and were identified like this. So, this is um, a very deadly mm -hmm. incident. There were other items like this, for example, the pebbles and the cork, which are two uh, instruments that are used, used as aids to, to uh, improve pronunciation. So the, the cork is used still today, I think, uh, yeah, still common, mm -hmm. to put it in, to just to uh, bite it and try to pronounce. It makes you aware of all the tongue movements and uh, it helps separate sounds, and the pebbles are related to... Uh, also mythological myth story. Yeah, not so mythological, but let's say, yeah, ancient Greek uh, story, but I will, not get, in, yeah. I will mm -hmm. not get into it because it's becoming a bit too detailed. But what we would like to uh, end with is that from, from this project, um, uh, can I, say, I want to say something? If you just, want to say something before you... <laughs> so just about the different, because it's... This, uh, all these different forms for us, they mainly bring a different uh, viewing experience and a different way to relate to the same material. So for, from our point of view, of course, we are totally... Um, emerged, no, not, we don't say it like that, we are totally submerged in, in this material and we, are sti we still find it fascinating, so it's interesting for us to find other ways to show it. But also as a, um, as a spectator, it gives, each one gives the spectator a totally different role. Because, for example, in the film, we are the total authors, you can say, although it's quite a loose film and you have a lot of work as a spectator, you have to, to do a lot of thinking and linking, but still we guide you in a narrative way from A to B through, I don't know, through different steps. And we are in full control of what you see and what you hear, not necessarily on what you get from it, but still. And while in the installation or the exhibition it's totally different, you, you make your own story and you... And also the order of uh, uh, encountering the, the parts m might make a different uh, whole, you know, it, even if it's just an, an, in terms of uh, an emotional experience. And in the performance there was also this very important aspect for us, which was more of a physical experience. And um, the fact of taking potentially each one of the participants, us included, taking potentially the role of, uh, of this person who is being uh, analyzed or stopped or encountering our own borders. This was a bit the idea of experience this, the experiencing it from within our own bodies or throats. Maybe now the Latin mm -hmm. is <laughs> okay. Um, well, as, as kind of a continuation to this, just to this project, we started, um, well, we in a certain point were interested on making a voice that is not um, that is not be traced as being a person uh, or a female or male that or something not, that has... That is not uh, attached to an identity. Mm -hmm. uh, because there are some 
attempt. I think that you know uh, today there are some sites where you can just type a text and then you would have a voice of uh, I don't know a famous actor or something. But then you would have a person a, a, a voice or a text of somebody. So it would be another identity. So we were working with two um, programmers to develop um, our own artificial voice and to create a combination of of our voices as a first step of of this um, of this uh, project. Um, so first, two voices were developed, well, like separately, a his voice and my voice, and. Um, what we want to finish with today is the combined voice. That is uh, basically a voice that would take a sentence uh, or a paragraph or a text and would uh, say it, but with a combination of us two. And it will, um, in a random manner, I mean, it, it, it has some sort of a, uh, some parameters why it would change from one voice to another. But if I'm to go here, um, and let's say... Are you inventing the text? Hmm? Yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe you can invent, like this you're sure it's not, it's not pre-recorded. <laughs> do you want to say something? Do you want us to say something? Can you give us some sentences? Please? <laughs> okay, so we would just like to thank you for your time and uh, listen, listen, listen. Mm -hmm. and we wish you a very nice evening. And we have to wait a couple seconds. So we would just like to thank you for your time and listening and wish you a very nice evening. <laughs> give give us something. Something else. Your yeah, yeah your just, your answer to I our wish. I would like shoes in size one hundred and two. Sorry? I would like shoes in size one hundred and two. Mm -hmm. I would like Shoes. 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 In size. One hundred and two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would like the shoes in size one hundred two. <laughs> Very good uh, finishing yeah. sentence. Uh -huh. Makes a lot good. of sense. <laughs> that, <laughs> only in English, so yeah. Only in English. That makes yes. an open ending, I would say. <laughs> yeah, basically, uh, for each language, we have to make a new model. Uh, now, of course, you can write something in That's French. Easy. This <laughs> we, we can write in whatever language, but it will read it as if it were English. No. It, it only knows these sounds. Like it was trained on an English model. Yes. But your English is not like this on the model. Exactly. Yeah, but it would take our English. Yeah, it would yeah. make the same mistakes. It was trained yeah. or on our English. With our mistakes and everything. Does it pronounce Shibola the correct way? No. You want to hear it? I, I, it's, it has a harder time to pronounce just separate words. Yeah. It does sentences better than words, but let's try she got it. <laughs> not so bad. Yeah. Well, for an English speaker, it's not a, a, big, a big issue because it, they, um, they can differentiate between 
Yeah, but it's not in English. Yeah, it's not in English, but thank you very much. And um, please come to see the film. <laughs> I, I think we also have some time for questions ah, if great. nobody yeah. uh, is in hypothermia yet. We are just afraid that everybody is freezing, so, yeah. but if you want, we are... Are people up for questions or do you feel you need medical attention at this point? <laughs> maybe just a, a couple, because I would like to ask you um, maybe a little bit more about the process, because uh, from what I understand, you had such a massive archive that also kept on expanding and growing. Um, were you, from the beginning, already thinking in terms of uh, mediums of expression, or was this just something that kind of came gradually, that suddenly had the aha moment of, okay, uh, there's a film in this? Um, I think it grew, um, but it was gradually. It is at first it was like um, this idea of presenting what, what we had, and I think the idea of the film, the two moments or two points where we said, okay, well, there, there can be a film and that can be something interesting. One was the, um, the visualization of sound, which uh, seemed to us as a cinematic question, uh, also an artistic question, but that could somehow in, in, in a cinematic way uh, be interesting. Um, and then the other thing, because when, when we started to, to research, we said, oh, well, uh, maybe we find ourselves uh, only with episodes from, you know, conflict areas somewhere. Uh, and then suddenly we, find, we found out about this uh, algorithm in Germany nowadays, or the, the test, uh, the test um, and the language test in, during the, the, the asylum procedure, and suddenly brought everything to, to our days, and the questions were, were much more actual. I think this was the second thing that made us um, understand that, I mean, there's a, there's a potential of, of a field. Yeah. But for example, with the exhibition, since you're also working with ready mates, were you already kind of collecting also physical material, thinking of how you would use this? Not that much. We were, there was, there were the film, the things that we produced for the film, or like, like this palette, or some things we encountered, but, uh, so we didn't collect, but uh, we always found it a pity not to be able to somehow include it. So it was about also about little stories that couldn't be in any way told in the film. And uh, um, also about this, yeah, there was like we kind of often missed this uh, physical aspect of things. But we made, uh, I think, 90% of the objects for the exhibition, mm -hmm. and not before. Yeah. Yeah, so it was not ready-made? Um... Some, somewhere, yeah, like, somewhere. for example, mm -hmm. uh, the page from the handbook, from mm -hmm. the manual, the, the, this, uh, the, the vocal tracks, for example. It's not us who designed it. We asked it from a researcher who designed it, and we just Printed it. Printed it. So the, we we produced them, but we, we did not invent them, or some of them. And are there other forms at the moment that you're thinking of in terms of dissemination, like a record, perhaps? Or... <laughs> I think we had enough. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Squeeze it. Nice. It's not that we are tired of it. This is quite uh, surprising because usually, I don't know, till now, uh, we don't like to linger on a work. I mean, the processes are long, but then when it's done, it's done. We move on. We, we always, yeah, we need something else. And with this one, it's kind of uh, kind, a bit exception, an exception for us that there are so many different ways that we approach it. But I, don't, I can't promise, but I think that's <laughs> it. Okay. Are there any questions from the audience? No? No? Please blink your eyes if you're still alive. Yeah. All right. Um, I, I think since the temperatures are quite harsh, can I just um, maybe remind you that there is no shibboleth in applause and that whoever you are, wherever you come from, you can give them a warm round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.